Thank you, Tom. So yesterday, for those of you that were here, we heard some amazing speakers talk to, and the, the same things that uh, Mark spoke about this morning, about how we are the message, and about the unserved flock, and about, um, Reverend Tom said, my story of my life is my parable. Uh, and some, uh, Ken Turner said, you live from the results of your practice. Sandra Campbell said, make your mess your message. So today, <laughs> part of my talk includes my mess that then became my message so that uh, you can see from beginning to end how this kind of thing unfolds. So as we all know, a narrative, a story is, is encapsulates truth. It's not about the events. It's about the underlying meaning or message that each person, each individual takes from it. And for me, it's about what was the belief system that I acquired along the way? And then how did that belief system play out. I was a um, fourth generation Swedish immigrant and what that taught me at that point in my life was that I was not one of you, I was one of them. I was apart from, I was separate, I was different and we celebrated the different um, Swedish holidays and, the, and with Swedish traditions etc and so I always kind of felt set apart. This was the cabin that my mom and dad lived in soon after I was born. It was a one-room cabin without running water, and that's a picture of my sister and I at an early age. I learned that without, you know, that there was this constant um, underlying theme of lack, of not enough. We moved to Missouri uh, when I was about eight years old in search of a better life. And what I learned from that is that a better life is out there somewhere. It's not in here. You know, it wasn't that people weren't hardworking or attempting to make, make better choices or any of those kind of things, but as you know, belief systems are passed down through family systems. And so I acquired, this is just a part, normal part of growing up. Hunting was one of the skills that I learned, as well as a number of other things. There were four girls in my family, and so we uh, all learned everything that we needed to be self-sufficient, which of course was another one of those underlying messages. You have to be self-sufficient. And this was a picture of the first sewing machine I was given. Now I learned to sew when I was about eight years old. It was a survival skill. We made our own clothes. We uh, mended everything that there was. We lived on the farm and so it wasn't you know, like you ran to town whenever you needed a new shirt or whatever. You just whipped it up. <laughs> so by the time I ended um, my time at home and, and was launched into the world, I had a plan in my mind. And this is what the plan looked like. I graduated from uh, high school, I went on to college, I um, thought that things would be rosy now because I was not encumbered by my past any longer. And that, that past did include sexual abuse as well as other kinds of uh, dysfunction in the family and so I thought I was set. I had everything that my family believed I needed to make my way in the world. Education, skills, career prospects. But this is what my path looks like. <laughs> I got tangled up with um, drugs and alcohol at an early age, and so I was um, immersed in the tangles that go along with that, and the codependent systems, and the, and the belief systems, and, and that type of thing. Along that way, um, I, I changed careers, I changed partners, I changed houses, I changed jobs. Those of you that are familiar with 12-step programs will recognize that as geographic changes. Just like when I was eight years old and we moved here, I'm still trying to rearrange everything outside of me to make my insides feel better. And so this, when I look back in the rearview mirror, is what my journey looked like more like this, in that wandering around. Fall in a hole, get up, try again. Fall in another hole, get up, try again. And then sometimes things seemed insurmountable. This is a 2008 picture of me, pictures of me. By this time, it's about 30 years later, 35 years later, I had been diagnosed with cancer. I had gotten into recovery from my addictions. Um, I was on disability. I had been told I would never work again. I had been told that I would always be on psychotropic medications. I was told I would not be able to be a functional human being, basically, and I was hopeless, lost, alone, and doing everything I knew how to do to be whole and well. 
and that included um, the 12-step meetings that I attended, 12, 13, 14 a week. It included physicians, surgeries, medical care, um, on and on and on. Everything that the outside world told me would fix me. I had become a churchgoer during that time frame and attended a church where I felt welcomed, where I felt supported, but I didn't feel connected. In fact, I was so disconnected, I was sitting on the back row of the church with my fingers in my ears during the message because it, it so discon I was so disconnected from the message. I'm sitting here like this, but I had to be in, in, the, in, the, um, in the space with the people that loved and supported me. And so there's this big disconnect with the message. Well, during this time, I was at home on disability, very little in the way of income, and that's when I met Kelly, and she said, actually I had met her a few years earlier, she said, you know, I always have people asking me to sew things for them. She was working in a, in a uh, fabric store, and can, I know you know how to sew. <laughs> Here, you can do this, and, and I said, no, <laughs> you're going to help me if you do. So that was, a, that was uh, 2005 is when we birthed this business. It was birthed out of personal need. It was birthed out of personal adversity. It was birthed out of the necessity for an income for ourselves. And at the, at the time, we had not, uh, the name of the business was We've Got You Covered. We had not centered on any particular line of work. It was just, uh, we got a sewing machine, <laughs> you know, so we sewed backpacks and tent tarps and cheerleader outfits and uh, ground cloths and any Anything, we, we drew the line at boat covers because we didn't have the space for that. But anything anybody wanted, we would try. And so we started narrowing down what seemed to be profitable. So the 12-step program that I'm in has, in the literature it says that it is a spiritual kindergarten. It says that we need to make use of religious teachings and what the world has to offer us in this way. And the line that stuck with me for a very long time says, quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. Well, the only spiritual principles I knew at that point were the ones that I was holding my fingers in my ears about <laughs> and the ones that I had learned through the 12-step program, which were the honesty, integrity, and courage, and hope, and faith, et cetera, et cetera. And I was working those to the best of my ability. During this time frame, however, I, um, I met Unity. Each and every person go. has inborn God-given powers. We can change our lives by learning to use these powers consciously and intentionally. The way we use or misuse these powers shapes our reality. Connect with your higher self. Connect with the divine. My point is that I needed to learn a different way of using these powers. As you know from the theology behind them, we all use them all the time. We can't not use them. But I tended to use them in ways that were destructive to me. And I didn't know that I had that power within me. For example, the power of strength. I would hold on to, to bad relationships. I would hold on to old ideas. I would hold on to preconceived notions that things had to be done this way or I could make it work if I just tried hard enough. I had no ability to use the power of release in terms of any of those things. And so it was, I'm going to hang on to this if it kills me, and it almost did. Um, all the way to, if I release something, I'm weak, I'm ineffective, I'm um, unworthy, I, it, was, it was attached to self-esteem. So these things all, um, when I took my 12 powers class, I recognized because of the exercises we were given to do, one power, one week, observe just that power every week, write about it, that these were the tools to unlock what happened for me. It took about six to eight weeks. By the time I hit that sixth or eighth power, I felt a click. I could watch myself and became the observer saying, oh, look at what you're doing again. While I was 
reacting emotionally, saying things to myself like, there's not enough. You know, I don't know when we're going to get a check-in. I can't get my coffee, you know. I don't go to the grocery store for another week, blah, blah, you know, all of that type of thing. So the tools that got me unstuck were the denials and the affirmations. This is not the truth of who I am. This is, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of God and I am well taken care of. Uh, this is a temporary situation and I have enough. And the 12 powers, one at a time, on whichever situation I was faced with. Lack and limitation, as I mentioned earlier, was my major, major root cause. Everything that I um, struggled with, I could go back to, to this. You know, I had fixed all the symptoms on the surface, as I mentioned earlier, but this, I don't have enough education. I don't have enough love. I don't have enough friends. I don't have enough connection. I'm not good enough. It all can be traced back to lack and limitation. When I worked on that root cause, my life changed. This is a Charles Fillmore quote, and he says that an uncontrolled imagination will often exaggerate and increase one's consciousness of trivial or even unreal things until both body and mind are affected. You could see that with me. The imagination is a very powerful faculty, and we must learn to discipline it if we would make it practical in serving our highest good. This was a, required a constant attention on my part, which is why working on one power at a time for an extended period of time was effective for me. I had a great imagination. After all, I had been taught, well, what's the worst that can happen? I had been given permission to imagine the worst and then plan for it. So guess what I got? No one is ever hopeless until he is resigned to his imagined fate. At the point that I was in 2008, I was resigned to my imagined fate. I had taken on the, the uh, ideas, I had taken on the opinions, I had taken on the, the um, general consensus of the community, the medical community among others, worked it over in my imagination and decided I was hopeless. But this opportunity presented itself through the sewing machine. It ties directly to prosperity principles as Tom was saying, if you ask for money, do not look for an angel from the skies to bring it on a golden platter but keep your eyes open for some fresh opportunity to make money, an opportunity that will come as sure as you live. I mentioned I was attached to old ideas, and the old idea was that my way was the way that was going to work. And so when new ideas present themselves, I was really good at shutting them down. No, that's not going to work. No, I don't want to do that. My lack of limitation kicked in. I don't have what it takes. There's not enough to do that. But manifestation is a two-step process. It's not sufficient to sit and hold thoughts of abundance without further effort. That is limiting the law to thought alone, and we want it to be fulfilled in manifestation as well. Prayer and visualization absolutely has its place. Imagination has its place, and it has to be followed with action. Cultivating ideas of abundance is the first step in the process. The ideas that come must be used. Be alert in doing whatever comes to you to do cheerful and competent in the doing. Sure the results, for it is the second step in fulfilling the law. If there was a disconnect in unity for me, it was the fact that I didn't understand the second half of that. I was told to pray, I was told to meditate, and things would appear. It seemed like there should be some more steps in between. I'm a pretty literal, linear type of person when it comes to my understanding and, and functioning in the world. And so when I found this, I got it. Two steps, two pieces. So today, this company is 12 years old. This is a, a snapshot of, of um, part of our staff. We have 20 employees. And we are located in the urban core of Kansas City, where we have provided employment. Um, we just moved there a couple of years ago. We po provide employment for people that are at risk. About half of our population is, is at risk population. They are um, deemed unemployable by other companies because they are post-incarceration. They have felony convictions, some of them. 
They um, have drug convictions. They have uh, children been removed from the home for, from DFS for one reason or another. They, um, many of them have struggled with addictions as I did. All of this puts them in the at-risk population. Many of them uh, quit high school, well, actually never went to high school. They quit sixth, seventh grade. Some of them were put on the street um, by their parent to help support the, the uh, family through prostitution and drug dealing and things of that nature. We don't have a box on an application form. We don't have an educational requirement on an application form. It's a second chance, start over, show us who you are, who you want to be kind of opportunity. So when I went to ministerial school, I determined that I wanted to bring this powerful message that had changed my life back to the populations I came from, to the people that were still suffering from lack and limitation thinking, from the people that were struggling with addiction, from the people that were stuck in recovery. And so I formed, my idea when I went to school was that I'm not doing a church ministry. What I am doing is bringing this message back to the people that really need it part of the unserved flock that, that uh, Mark talks about. So I made uh, a brochure and printed some business cards and I started a teaching and counseling type ministry thinking I was going to be working with my former peer group. That's not who, how it evolved. But that stands as it is and I do that kind of work now as well as several other things. Brene Brown, and um, when I get to the bottom of the page here, quotes in a, in a book that hope is not an emotion, but a way of thinking. I was hopeless, at the, which was my way of thinking at that point in time. But that hope is a process and that it can be taught. You have to ha be able to have a goal. Well, I had a goal. I wanted to feel better. I wanted my life to work. You have to have a pathway. That's what I was lacking. I did not understand how do I get from here where I am sick, hopeless, unable to function to someplace else. And I have to have agency, a belief I could do it. I didn't have that either. Um, University of Kansas researcher C.R. Snyder is the one who did this research and came up with this formula, but uh, Brene Brown quotes it in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. This resonated with me. The people that I work with today, they have goals. But they don't always have a pathway. And they often don't have agency. And so that is what the ministry, big umbrella word, ministry is about for me. So we found out we couldn't hire all of these people. We have people knocking on our doors wanting a job. We don't have that many jobs and we had to train people along the way. So we determined that we needed to open a training center. So this is the newest nonprofit that we've opened and it is, it's got three purposes. The first purpose is job skill training so that people have a, have a skill set to take into employment. They have a, um, a certificate that says I can do these things, whatever they may be. And then um, it's to perpetuate this legacy American art form called sewing. There are a bazillion kinds of sewing. It's not just, just a straight stitch on a sewing machine. There is a movement in Kansas City to bring manufacturing back to the garment district. Um, there's another organization that's working on that and also working with the at-risk population. And if, they, if that is successful, they're going to need a workforce and vocational training can provide that workforce and we have people that are eager and willing and engaged and committed that want to work. So we opened this training center. And then the, the third but the very, for me, most important aspect is to provide a safe, nurturing, emotionally and spiritually supportive community. When you put a sewing machine on the table and gather a bunch of women around it, conversations happen. Conversations like, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble with my kids. Conversations like, you know, I've got this and this in my pantry and I don't know what to make out of it. Uh, conversations like, you know, I was in church last Sunday and they told me this about God and the way my past has been, that doesn't work for me. These conversations come up naturally. And part of what happens then is you exchange what's called social capital. And that's what I'm all about, is when you mix people from different zip codes, Everybody brings their own network of connections, their own network of knowledge, their own information base into the room, and everybody grows. This is part of what Jim was talking about, is it lifts everybody up, because we share. 
And so we, um, we are a volunteer-run organization at this point. Very limited funding. Uh, we don't hire experts. We have women coming out of the everywhere, driving in two, three hours, wanting to serve, wanting to help, wanting to support. Um, they are experts in their field in all of these ways, uh, everything from garment to, to quilting and in between. Um, we are going to be training in entrepreneurial activities. There's a vast amount of resources in the Kansas City area that are free to very little cost in the Kauffman Center and other places where people can be referred to once they have their idea and, the, and the, the nugget, the seed that they're going to grow, they can get the additional skill sets that they need. Um, there's lots of uh, opportunities for fulfillment and contract work. Somebody needs 500 book bags. Somebody needs 200 aprons. Somebody needs a bunch of hot pad holders or, or what have you. So um, the students then come from everywhere, including the people that have money, the people that are affluent, the people that are, um, have skills but want to polish them up again, as well as the at-risk um, companies, you know, at-risk, I'm sorry, populations. Um, I work with particularly people from Amethyst Place uh, just because I got connected up there when I was in seminary. And what I did, just as an aside uh, to Mark's point about LUTs and, and ministers, I, I made an intentional um, decision to go the minister path. I was on the fence for a long time, but I felt like minister would open more doors for me than LUT, so I went minister path. And in, in school, I aimed every single paper, every independent class, every internship in the direction of serving this population. And so I had an internship at uh, this transitional housing place, recovery housing place around the corner from where we are now uh, called Amethyst Place. So some of the students come from there. We're working with Voc Rehab uh, to provide jobs, trainings for people referred through the Voc Rehab. Journey to a New Life is a post-incarceration for women uh, program in the Kansas City in, on the Troost uh, Corridor that these women have little hope of getting a job. They've been incarcerated multiple times, some for multiple uh, offenses, many for drug offenses. One, one young woman, uh, 17 years old, when she went to prison for a bottle of Xanax that didn't have her name on it. You know, I mean, there's just all these horrendous stories that, that go along with that. We had a project this past summer where we contracted to uh, fix 20,000 pairs of pants, men's pants. I went up and down the street there into these facilities and hired uh, 38 women for a six-week job. And we were able to put $25,000 in wages east of Troost. That makes a difference in people's lives. And it's open to the public. The classes that we offer are open to anybody because that's part of the plan, that side by side, elbow to elbow, you don't know who you're in class with and it doesn't matter. We can all come together at that one point. And I have to also mention that we support our workplace and we support our, uh, the nonprofit from recovery principles and from unity principles. And, and it's bringing those into the workplace that allow people to feel valued, to understand that they are not a mistake. They might make a mistake, but they are not a mistake. And you can watch their self-esteem rise. This is a, um, a prayer, pictures from a prayer class, not a prayer class, prayer flag class that we had a few weeks ago. Um, Tom B., one of the uh, local Zen monks, came in and did a little instructional thing for us. And these were some of the, the prayer flags that came out of it. We purposely do not, uh, we demonstrate the principles as opposed to preach or teach the principles. And so, each person took, had their own take on a prayer flag, but it's what it meant to them. We, have, uh, we had a quilting retreat last summer, upper left-hand corner there. We do pop-ups in libraries and other places. The bottom left-hand corner is one of those, last Halloween. Once a month, we have uh, craft days where we invite uh, people in with their families and in a big community space kind of way, just have fun together. Unity of Independence is critical in uh, the support that they give us in this way, and it's not 
financial support, it's energy support. The community comes together and once a month they, they make the kits that we use in training. They, they cut the fabrics to size and they package the certain number of pieces of whatever we're going to need for the upcoming month uh, into bags. And it, it provides a bonding opportunity here. Uh, for the people of this congregation who don't necessarily want to travel down to Midtown to be able to support us in that. I already mentioned the social capital exchange about building relationships. This is all built on relationships. Shared passions and interests. We have people say, I'd love to help, but I don't sew. And I say, great, come on down. We need people that can just sit beside and say, what are you doing? Well, that's interesting. When did you learn how to sew? What are you going to do with this? Oh, you know what? My son had that same problem. Hey, I've got a recipe I want to share with you. We need people to make cookies. <laughs> we need people to just be a positive presence in the room. Let's see. I'm going backwards. Let's go forwards. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, um, something I snagged off the internet to illustrate the idea about networks. You know, each of you know people I don't know. Each of you function in circles that I don't function in. Some overlap, some do not overlap, but the idea is that we expand the circles to include more people in a positive way. I really like this quote a lot, Fillmore. The real object of life is not making money or becoming famous, but the building of character, the bringing forth of the potentialities that exist in every one of us. I like to think that's what we're doing. So people ask me, well, how do you get funded? How do you pay for this? This book was immensely helpful to me. It, it had um, two or three things that were so useful, and, and uh, Jim already mentioned those. Why should I give to you? I want to, how are lives changed? And the number one reason is if people believe in your mission. So they have to know what the mission is. Not a fancy mission statement, but how are your lives changing? How are your lives changing in the programs that you're running? So our, our um, patchwork of support includes financial support from private donors. We've had a couple people um, provide significant uh, checks to us to, to fund the machines and hard costs that we have. We have uh, people that fund scholarship donations. The classes are not expensive. And um, they'll say, well, I want to send a woman to class. So here's, here's a check for however much. Uh, In-kind donations. So many people's uh, parents do not carry on. They're going, in, they're going into nursing homes and such, uh, care facilities and all. What are you going to do with grandma's sewing machine and her whole room full of fabric and notions and all, all of that? Well, it, we don't want it to go to a landfill. We accept any of it. That come, it doesn't matter how old it is that it comes across our, our uh, radar. And so we have a, store pile, a storehouse, a stockpile of these uh, things that are available to the community that comes in to sew. They pick up their fabric here, and once they learn a few skills, we send a machine home with them. We repurpose it out into the community. It's a green reuse of everything as well as somebody gets benefit from it. Uh, right now, we've got you covered as a major corporate sponsor. And what that means is they're paying my, my salary while I'm out running around recruiting people and doing things, uh, as well as we are in space that they have provided. They, we, you know, depends on which hat I'm wearing. Um, we have others that are in that, that realm as well. Nonprofit partnerships, some of the agencies that I mentioned earlier. Government partnerships, we're working with the um, Jackson County Family Court System to develop a program for the at-risk youth, the girls from 13 to 17 years old who are in detention for one reason or another. They, they came to us and asked if we could do that. Uh, we have a homeschool group that is wanting to use our space for some of their activities. Um, Faith-based partnerships, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but suffice it to say that we're not the only ones who are in the market to do mission work out in the field, and there are a number of like-minded um, faith-based organizations that say, oh, you're doing this, let's not duplicate efforts, let's do it together. And so we're forging partnerships like that. We are just starting to uh, apply for grants, both private and governmental grants. There are some, a lot of um, 
uh, red tape, you might guess, around all of that. And since this is a, uh, a volunteer organization at this point, we've not been able to put the resources in terms of time together to make that happen. We've also been in discussions with the Economic Development Councils in Wyandotte and Leavenworth County, as well as in uh, Jackson County, looking for how can we partner with businesses that are looking for employees and have them play, pay the training costs to bring people into the training programs. So the other organizations, this is the, the latest iteration. This organization is about three months old. Uh, five of us not working in the nonprofit space with the at-risk community came together and we put together this organization as a coalition. And this was specifically for the purposes of being able to do cross-referrals. Not everybody wants to learn to sew and to share resources. I don't want to have to hire a social worker that can provide mental health counseling or uh, referrals into other public agencies just because I have a woman here that's sewing that needs those services. And so we've come together to, to form this organization called KC Works Together to see how we can partner, how we can go forward, how can we make the most of the resources that we are given, how can we help these people that fall through the cracks even with all of the other public agencies and uh, social services that are available. We had, an org we had a meeting in February that was our uh, inaugural meeting, a kickoff meeting. We had 70 other organizations and people represented. Everything from government to um, other churches to, to individuals that were trying to start an effort. There's a lot of interest in this, in this arena. And so, according to me, <laughs> this is what I would consider to be the components of, of our successful um, engaged spiritual action. First is to practice the, the same principles in all our affairs. It's a 12-step principle, and it is a unity principle. Live the truth you know. When we're consistent, we model for other people. See the divinity in each individual. There is no we, they, there are us, them, there is, you, you know, you and I coming together in a, in a single place. Uh, as they desire, we support people in prayer. Listening is a very, very big deal. Being able to sit with somebody and have them share from their heart without being judgmental, without fixing them, without uh, telling them how to run the rest of their life or what you really need is, they hear that from everybody. But they don't feel seen, they don't feel heard, and they don't feel valued until you make a one-on-one -on -one connection with them and look them in the eyes and hear their story. So we meet the people where they are in their own community. That's why I'm out running around up and down the street and talking to people and, and uh, going to the transitional living spaces and things of that nature. There are many that have, the, uh, this is a cycle that happens when somebody gets clean and sober or out of jail. The first thing they do is they're told that they have to find a higher power. Their old way of life didn't work. They decide to do that and so they go back to the church they came from. In somewhere between two or three months and two or three years, they figure out that it is incongruent with who they have been, who they are, and they need a different path. I work with those people on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, to support them where they are. Sometimes they end up in the, in the Buddhist community. Sometimes they end up in the Mormon community. Sometimes they end up in a unity community. But it matters not to me which community they get connected to as long as it works for them. And so I support them in their process of of wandering. I spent a number of years doing that very same thing. I know what that feels like. I teach meditation, denials, affirmation, and other metaphysical spiritual tools as necessary. Now many of these people grew up in systems that didn't have boundaries. They don't know how to say no. Survival is codependency. Whatever you want, that's what I give you so that I get what I need from you. And so being able to say no, that's not going to work for me, is a big skill to learn. So we work on those kind of things, but I don't necessarily call them by the name that we would know them by inside the walls of a unity church. I speak the vernacular that they understand at the level that they want to implement. I refer to the needed supportive services. This is where KC Works Together comes into play so that um, I have some place to refer when a, a domestic violence victim comes to me and says, I have to have some dental work. That's the first thing you may not know. It's the first thing that happens when somebody gets hit is they start losing teeth. I didn't know a dentist, but guess what? I know somebody that knows a, a dentist that will do pro bono work. 
collaboration with other organizations I've spoken about, and probably most importantly is attending to your own spiritual practices. When I am not centered, I am not able to give what I do not have to somebody else. I cannot share at a level that is both authentic and healing for them if I am still in my woundedness. And so you might imagine that it requires a lot of attention to my own spiritual practices, whatever those are. So um, I want to share something with you here. This is a video segment that was created by Unity Worldwide Media through funding from the John Templeton Foundation. It's a sneak preview. It's going to be released next week or the week after in time for Easter. It's meant to demonstrate how unity principles can be applied to create a cultural shift in what it means to live in community and engage in business without disengaging from our sense of oneness. It's important to contemplate at Easter when we consider our own transformation and our own resurrection experiences and what it means to experience and be the example of a new life in the world.